you want to learn how to make a door like this one, or this one, stay tuned. What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I wanted to say welcome to the Dungeon Door video. Uh, first up, I'm gonna take you over to the home center where we're gonna go around and pick up all the different parts that we need to make the door before we bring them all downstairs into the shop next door and actually get to creation. So first up, 30 by 80 inch door. This is a hollow core door. You can see right here, $84. So. That's how much for a hollow core version. Again, we're building one that's more similar to a hollow core or a solid core door. Let's move down a little bit here and find ourselves a solid core door. So right here, 30 by 80 solid core door. $126. Now again, this is pre-hung. So it's gonna come with the jam and everything. You're gonna have stuff to cut out your old studs. It's also gonna come with the hinges and it's gonna come drilled out for, uh, for your hardware. So we are going to go see how much we can get all the stuff we need for our door compared to this. All right, so materials for our actual door. These are just, what are these officially? Two by four, 96 inch burled premium first studs. This is right up here, 375 a piece. This is what you're gonna wanna use for the outside edge of it. One thing get is make sure it says, I think you can see right here, it has KDHT, that's kiln drying heat treated. This should keep your wood, in theory, from cupping and uh, you can just grab, you're gonna probably need about four or maybe five of these to do what you're gonna need to do for the door. Two of these for the kind of long sides of the door, one you can cut to do the short side and then the other piece to do the supports. I'd grab five just to have an extra just to be safe. But with five, we're looking at about 16-ish, 17 bucks or so for just the two by fours. Obviously, if you have the wood already, that'll be a little bit easier. So that's the main piece of the door. Next, we're gonna go get the shiplap. All right. And the main crux of the build are these here, one by six by eight, tug and groove pattern shiplap boards here. These are 584 a piece. We're gonna need 12 of these. So this door's gonna be heavier than pretty much any standard door you're gonna make. So you're gonna wanna have a decent hinge. So I've been looking at all of these various varieties of hinges. You'll probably be okay with this three pack here. This is three hinges. These are pretty sturdy looking. Looks like they're not gonna be as thick as your full thickness door though when you go to attach those hinges and kind of morse them out. Um, it is 10 and uh, $10, 77 cents for a three pack. You could go with a little bit chunkier hinge here, four and a half inch. Basically, you're gonna to wanna to have something with some sizable screws, because you're gonna have a very heavy door. So I'll show you what I think I'm gonna get, but we're also gonna to wanna to get one of these guys right here, which is uh, the ball catch that we're actually gonna to use to keep the door shut, since we're not gonna have a typical actual door knob that you're gonna turn. We're gonna have the pull like you saw on that other door. This ball catch is what's gonna actually hold it shut. That's gonna run us seven eight bucks all right let's keep going down here and i think your best bet is going to be to look at things more like a gate hinge uh because that's essentially what we're going to look at so if you come down here you can see you can buy these decorative straps these don't do anything they just go on your door for the purposes of making it look like it has an old timey hinge um, which is fine, right? You could use those. That's 10 or $8 for a piece of metal that's actually not going to do anything. Then we have these longer hinges here. This is, what is this? 18, 20 bucks for these big long hinges here. Uh, and that is a two pack. So if we take a look here. Each one of these hinges will hold uh 40 pounds each so four of these 
will definitely hold our door. Um, and we can get these right here at the home center. So we may want to go with those. You'll have its options. You can showcase all these different kinds of strap style hinges we could use. Any one of these would work. And then you're going to want to get some kind of a handle to pull your door open with. You can go for um, these style handles. You could actually get like garage door kind of handles. Something to be able to pull and close your door. And again, you're going to want to have one for both sides. And I figured I should technically address it. I've been calling the board shiplap. They're not technically shiplap due to the design of the interlocking mechanism. They are a one by six by eight tongue and groove pattern board, as I said when I was at the home center. However, shiplap is just easier to say. Technically, shiplap has basically a, a lap joint on the end where you're going to be putting basically two half laps together to make the joint rather than a tongue and groove. It just I don't want to get yelled at by any woodworking enthusiasts that I've been calling a tongue and groove board a piece of shiplap, which is technically not, um, but it's just easier to say than tongue and groove pattern board. Point of fact, this door handle does not exist anymore on Amazon. I went to the creator who actually made this handle. I cannot find it. You can still get this. It was around like 20 bucks. So I put in that uh, this handle here, this Everbuilt handle that we got uh, again at the home center on the back side. So you can see here, this is a pretty meaty handle. You can really get your whole hand around it. I put this handle on the back just to have something to pull the door shut. And it's, I can't actually fit my whole hand in there, but it's only being used to pull the door shut. So that's probably not a huge deal, but something to consider. And again, here's our little ball hatch, our ball catch that we got to keep our door shut. So I'm not really sure how it happened, but at some point during production and working on this stuff, I apparently lost some of the early videos. So I'm going to do my best to replicate how I did those without actually making all the cuts and everything to show you what was done. So basically what you're not going to be able to see in the video is me actually cutting the outside frame and those 2x4s and then fastening them together. This is probably better because I was still early on, still figuring out how to shoot that. But basically what we did was we took measurements for our existing door. We transferred them to 2 by 4s and made those cuts. So I just took a measurement of the door to get you an idea. So my door to fit my space was 29 and a half wide by 79 and 3 quarters inches tall. That's a typical door. It's typically if you were to go buy one at the store, you'd see something like 30 by 80, which is what that is my space a little bit tighter, but that's because of some of the work we did that you'll see later on. So basically, all I did was take my compound miter saw there and cut the 2 by 4 So I cut two 2 by 4s to 79 and 3 quarters inches. That was the two long boards. And then I took the other two boards, and that was supposed to be 29 and a half across total. But remember, we have this 2 by 4 facing sideways, which is 3 and a half inches, Plus this 2 by 4 you add those two together, that's 7 inches. So for our total width, it's going to be that 29 and a half minus 7. So it's going to be 22 and a half because we're going to, you know, attach the boards side by side like this using pocket screws. So basically all I did was cut our two long boards, lay them on the floor, take this short board over to my pocket hole jig, drill the holes in it, and then fasten them together to make an outside square and put boards in between. All right, so here's where I have my Craig pocket hole jig. Again, obviously not sponsored, <laughs> though if Craig jig is watching and they really want to sponsor a D&D YouTuber, by all means. Um, so you can see there is a little method right here that kind of locks things down. And basically, you adjust the thickness of your board. So this is a two and uh, two by four, so it's one and a half inches thick. So we'll go ahead and lift up this, this little block that comes out, and we'll go ahead and put it in for one and a half, right? Or is it, there's a positive stop, there we go, right there, for one and a half inches thick. Now, we're gonna put our two holes in this board to fasten it. We're gonna slot it in here, tighten down this clamp in the back that holds it in place so it doesn't move. And then you need to use a special stepped tapered drill bit here with a collar on it. 
and that kind of goes down in and we'll drill our holes. So we'll go ahead and put this in our drill. And I will put I'll drill a hole in here. I don't think I'm going to do one because one, this makes a ton of mess. So you're going to want to have your vacuum hooked up. They even make it a vacuum attachment that goes in here to pull up all the sawdust. And when you're doing a lot of these, it makes a lot of mess. But basically, you screw this down like this. And you take it back out. Make a bunch of sawdust mess. And then you would unclamp it. And then here's your hole. Okay? You've got your your pocket holes right there. So I had to swap out my drill bit for a custom Craig bit that's designed for these pocket screws. It's a square drive screw. And the screw itself has sort of like a flat kind of pancake head. And that's designed to hold into the pocket hole. Again, there are a ton of videos, even from the manufacturers of this, as well as from a ton of other woodworkers to show you how pocket screws work and why they are the way they are. So you basically slide your screw into the hole that you what we just drilled. And then you're gonna wanna try to keep your boards tight together. You may wanna clamp these um, or have somebody else kinda hold them because they tend to wanna pull when you screw uh, this in. So we're gonna go ahead and put our bit into the screw here. And then we're gonna try to keep this as much of a right angle as we can here. And screw it in. So, yeah, now I can just tighten that up. Now, we have our board is fastened, and this is, this is only one screw. And this is pretty strong, so if we had the second screw in there, it would be even stronger. You just have to be mindful of the thickness of your wood, because these are 2 by 4s I used a 2.5 inch screw. Normally, if I'm doing one by wood, I'm going to use a one and a quarter inch screw. But basically, we did this all the way around the outside to make basically the outside rectangle you'll see uh, you know, the base frame of the door in the next part of the video. The only thing you'll notice is that in my frame, you'll see the outside frame, which was those four boards we talked about initially. I also put some cross supports. Now, in a normal door, even the ones you'll buy at the store, they typically have the outside frame and at least one support in the middle to help keep the door from flexing as it heats and you know your house gets hot and cold and wood can warp it'll help keep it more rigid so for mine i put you'll see there's four supports running across and that's because i'm using strap hinges those kind of outside decorative looking hinges they fasten to the outside of the door and because of that i need a solid mounting point to screw the screws into that are holding them on so I measured out where I was going to have my hinges on the door, and then I put, I cut spacers to have them all make sure that I could keep uh, the blocks, you know, equidistant apart. And then I put in those four cross supports that you see. And the reason they're there is for mounting the strap hinges to once the door is all put together. I set myself up a stop block there. That way I can, since I have to make 12 repetitive cuts to cut all of these tongue and groove boards over here uh, all of these tongue and groove boards these all got to get cut to 79 and three quarter inches to match the height of the door so rather than having to cut and measure every or rather measure and then cut every single board individually i set up this stop block i made a uh you know temporary fence out of this piece of pvc Glue, you know, clamped a stop block to it that'll cut all the boards perfectly at 79 and 3 quarters inches. And that makes my life a lot easier. There you have it. Perfectly cut to 79 and 3 quarter inches. So we're up in the garage now. And I got my table saw set up here. So as I was saying in the last video, you can see that there's a groove on this side and there's the tongue on this side. Now, because we wanna have this end on the door, we don't wanna have that showing. So what we're gonna do is, for all intents and purposes, one of the boards on both sides on the left, we're gonna cut, say, the tongue off, and the other side, we're gonna cut the groove off. This is a good opportunity where if you picked up boards uh, and you get them back home or after you cut them, 
uh, you notice that there's a little bit of imperfections or kind of damage on the tongue or the groove, this is a good time to choose those particular boards to cut off. Then I'll show you an example. Um, I have one over here. Let's see. Ah, this one. I don't know if you can see this, but the here's where the tongue is supposed to be, and it's kind of sheared off. It broke off when I was cutting it. So for this board, we're going to cut the groove off of this side, and it kind of almost already did that for us, but we're just going to clean that up. So, take tape measure. I think it's pretty much the same distance on both sides. So if we're going to cut the tongue off of these, it is going to be about five-eighths or so of an inch. Three-eighths. It's three-eighths of an inch. And we're basically just going to run those boards through, cut off those tongues or grooves, and then we're done for this. Again, if you were doing this, you could just do this with a circular saw if that was the case. That was the hard part so now that all those boards are ripped down we can basically just take those back down where the rest of the boards and the frame is down in the basement and start assembly so now comes my favorite part which is the actual assembly of the door so we're going to be taking those boards that we took this is one of the ones that i cut the groove off of put it on this end or sorry the tongue off of we're going to run it the whole length of it glue them all together tack them down so any wood glue will work. I've got tight bond too. Again, that's fine. So we're just gonna take a little bit and put it here on the board along the edge. And I have one of these silicone um, like basting brushes that I cut the uh, bristles down a little bit. And we're just gonna basically spread on the glue. Uh, and then what's really important, probably the most important thing is you don't wanna overdo it too much because you don't wanna have the glue uh, kind of really seep out the sides of the board when you put that top board down because if you do that then you're going to have issues where you're going to have to sand the boards immensely because when you go to stain this thing after the fact the uh, the glue will appear a different color than your base board and if that happens then that's just going to be a nightmare in sanding i don't know if you can see but we have nice long clean coverage on this board. Now we're just gonna flip our end board over, kind of sister it up to the end here. I glue down the board and I just put a clamp, a squeeze clamp here on the end. I'm gonna load some nails into the nail gun here. Um, and we're gonna fasten down the end here and we're just gonna kind of adjust this board as we go to make it fit as closest to the outside edge. So we're flush on the side here and we're flush on the bottom. So we'll just drive in a couple of nails right here. And right again right here. All right, so we have our first board in. And now, basically, we're just gonna take our next board. I'm not gonna bother doing it here, but you'll see that the tongue fits right here into this groove. And we'll basically go along the whole length of the board, match all of these up where they need to be, and then with that's done, we can uh, move along onto the next board and the next board and so on and so on and so on. Just a little fun fact when you're gluing these boards together, make sure you put the glue on the tongue and not in the groove. Originally, when I had did this the first time, I was like, oh, it'll make sense. I've got a nice little pocket. I'll fill this all up with glue and then I can sandwich the boards together and then I don't really have to worry about the glue running out the side but I'm going to take these two boards and I'm going to stick them together and I want you to take a look. See that right there? It doesn't actually go all the way in. Like if this is in here and this is kind of locked in, but you can see there's that gap there right in the middle, so it doesn't actually go all the way in and touch to the inside of the groove. So if you just put your glue in the groove, these will, uh, you know, you might, if you really glob it in there, you might get it a lot, but 
Uh, you're probably just better off putting a little bit right here along the tongue, or maybe even on the tip of the tongue, really, and then pushing them together, because that way it won't squirt out all over the side. Because uh, again, what I had on my original door was all in this groove right here, was I had, and of course, the glue that would come out is all in the groove, the hardest part to sand, because you can't get like a nice orbit sander in there, you gotta use sandpaper and kind of fold it up to get in there to sand that. So, anything you can do, or, or just be really adamant about wiping down any excess glue that comes out, like, before it starts to harden, have a wet cloth on hand, uh, just get that done as soon as possible. So we're just gonna put dab of glue kind of along the edge of our, uh, oops, a little much there, on the edge of our tongue here. Just slide right into place, come up here, do the same thing, just to make sure we get it pushed in. So, here you can see our fully finished one side of the door. Now comes the fun part where I have to try and flip this thing over by myself to the other side, but things should be significantly easier now because we have a flat surface to rest it on. So, I am beyond frustrated because more of the footage was lost than I thought the entire process of fitting the door in the frame and finishing it. So what I did was I tore out my old pre-hung door and ripped out these, uh, the two side door jams and the top plate. I just peeled those off and pulled the, the nails out. It was only held in with nails. Then I replaced this, uh, the hinge side with a 2x4 because I wanted a good strong structure to mount those strap hinges to. This little three quarter of an inch door jam would have absolutely split if I drilled into it. And even if I pre-drilled, it might still have split because I was using two inch construction screws because I wanted something solid to hold up this big heavy door. So that was that. Uh, but I also lost the entire finishing process, how I went and sanded and stained all of the door boards here that you're looking at. So let me give you a quick rundown on how that worked. So. I have a cut off piece of the board here. You can see that these boards are not the best shape. So what I did was I used my random orbit sander uh, here and I used an 80 grit sandpaper to really chew down a lot of the really rough spots. And I'll show you, and I, the reason I did this is because as I stated at the start, these boards are pretty rough. Now if I zoom this in, you can see how just rough and divoted and choppy this board is that's due to just the nature of the boards that i happen to get so they were really rough so my last door i didn't have to go i just did 220 sandpaper on the whole thing and then threw the stain on it these ones were really bad so i sanded them all down as best i could with 80 grit sandpaper to try to clear off as much of the rough material as i could but 
It became apparent after a little bit of sanding that I needed more than just that. So to fill in gaps like that, I used wood filler. I used DAP plastic wood. Um, I got this at, again, at Home Depot at the Home Center. Um, and this is a natural uh, um, stain or color. You can get ones that are colored to the specific wood, but this can be stained. You could also take and gather up all the sawdust you had from your cutoff boards and mix it with wood glue till you'll make kind of a putty and make your own wood filler. I'm notoriously bad at doing that, so I use the pre-made stuff. The only problem is, board to board you may see a difference in stain, but this wood filler is going to look different than your board because of just the nature of the materials. So if I zoom this in on the door, you should be able to see, if I bring this in focus here, um, a couple of the different spots. You can actually see it right there. So right here, see how that's like a lighter, different color than right here? That's because this is wood filler. And again, I sanded this thing down heavily with 80 grit sandpaper. And then I went over the 80 grit with a 220 grit sandpaper to give it a nice smooth finish. And even though this is smooth to the touch, this still has a different coloration. And that's because of that wood filler just being an entirely different material than the baseboard. Uh, so that is that. Then, once I had everything all sanded down the way I liked it, and had it, oh, I should say I fit the board, the door in the, in the space. And I did that first because if I had to make cuts, I wanted to do it on an unfinished surface. So again, I sanded it all down, used the wood filler where I needed it, and then I used this, the Minwax Pre-Stain. Now this is used for conditioning woods that you're going to stain. This is a pine board, um, and you can kind of see it on here. You can see like splotchy versus smooth, and that's what this stuff does. It treats and conditions the boards to accept stain better and to give you a nice even coat. So I actually didn't do this on my first door over there because I didn't have any. So I went out and picked some up before I did this door because I was going to show you the process, but obviously that didn't happen. So you just dip this in, uh, dip a rag in here and just wipe it on. You can be pretty liberal with it, just go to town. Um, and you have to let it dry for about 5 to 15 minutes. And then sometime after that period and before two hours are done, you apply your actual finish stain. So I'm partial to Minwax Special Walnut. That's the coloration you see here. It's a nice dark wood. I really like that. This can has actually been with me for almost 10 years. I've used it on every woodworking project I've ever done. Uh, and it still holds up. So I used this on there first. Again, just dipped a rag in it, wiped it on, waited a little bit. Then again, just dipped a rag in this and wiped it on. You can use brushes, but I find rags are cheaper and easier. You can use an old t-shirt, an old sheet, even an old towel if you want to put this on there. Uh, and then that was it, right? So normally, uh, in some cases, you might want to put it with a sandpaper and then put a second coat on. I've never put a second coat of stain on any project I've ever done. Um, and they also say to wipe off the excess after you're done staining it. Well, the room I'm in has a very powerful dehumidifier that pulls the moisture out of the air, pulling the moisture out of the wood, drying this significantly faster. You also should put, typically, a finish, some sort of lacquer, shellac, polyurethane on top of this to protect it. Stain is not a protectant. If I were to hit this with like a hammer or a chisel or a screwdriver and hit it pretty hard, you're going to see the wood underneath because I'm just taking off layers of wood. I have a wipe on polyurethane, which is again similar to what I just used there. You put it on a rag, you wipe it on, you do a couple different coats of that, and it gives you a nice finish and a protectant. I didn't do it on this door because I didn't do it on the other door. Again, I didn't have any to do the other door, and I didn't feel like trying to stain it while it's already hung up on the wall because it'll be dripping down. But the main reason is there are the polyurethane is going to provide either a satin or a gloss finish, something different than just stain on natural wood. And I wanted to keep that separate because I didn't want the doors to look different. So now you're gonna see me go to the other side and we're gonna be putting in the hinges. Just noticed in the footage that was lost, I didn't explain the screws that I used in, in fastening the door. So for fastening the hinges to the two by four, I used these number nine, two and a half inch construction screws. These are a construct, they're designed, a lot of people use um, drywall screws. These are a construction screw. They're designed to be held into structure. They have a Torx head. 
here so that's harder to slip out and this is a nice strong thing to screw into that uh that two by four and the ones you saw me putting in to actually attach the strap hinge to the face of that were these these are uh, called trim head screws these are number eight two inch trim head screws and the reason i use these is because if you look this is a very thin profile if you were to say compare this screw to this screw, you can see a sizable difference, right? And the reason why is for the most part, except in very rare circumstances, these screws will not split boards. They're designed to leave a very small hole. So if you were gonna put them somewhere and you wanted to fill it with wood filler, it leaves a tiny little hole. But for the most part, just the nature of these screws don't split the wood. So I could put them where you saw me putting them in those strap hinges and I did not risk splitting the boards open even when I was fastening through a joint. And that's why I use these. Plus they kind of have this nice like off kind of bronzy gold color and I liked the contrast of that with, um, you know, with the black hinges. All right, so I shimmed out the door frame there. I don't know if we turn this, if you can see it but I put some shims in here to get what we needed to and now our door shuts. So we're good there. Next up is, I already cut the piece of trim. This is just a one by three because that's gonna bridge this gap. So we'll hide the spaces from the shims so you don't have to worry about that. I already cut that on the 45. I just need to stain it and then we'll nail it in place here. That'll cover that up. Another thing that I did was I added in, I reused those old door stops that I took off. So basically what I did was I had somebody stand on this side of the door um, and shut it to where it needed to be so it was kind of flush with the outside of this frame. And then I just marked on the inside and tacked on this door stop right here. So that's what's, when we go to shut the door, that's what's stopping the door from going further back than it needs to. Oh, you know, I don't know if I showed you that I screwed on uh, the hardware. So this is just, again, the handle that I bought. It's just a cheap handle from Home Depot. I screwed this on here and I screwed a different kind of smaller handle on the inside to pull it shut. All right, folks, as you can see, I have finished putting the trim uh, around the door, top, bottom, or top and sides, rather. Um, all this is is just a simple one by three Stand, uh, sanded and stained using the same stain we used to do the door. Uh, I cut the corners there on a 45 degree angle there to just make a miter cut. Uh, and then I just tacked that in with some nails from my nail gun. But I also painted the inside of this door. It used to be kind of white. And then obviously there's parts where it wasn't painted where I took the old trim and door stops and things off. So uh, I painted it a dark brown because that way if the door is shut, and you can see any kind of the trim around little gaps and in inaccuracies in the door itself, uh, you don't see bright white shining through, you see dark brown, or you don't see it at all because of the shadows. Um, now what I'm gonna do is I have our door stop, and the fit isn't completely perfect, uh, but it's, it's really good and to help keep uh, sound and sawdust and other things out of there. I'm gonna install some weather stripping around the side here and the top and maybe on the inside corner just to help get a better seal because the goal of this door is to keep sawdust and other things in the shop. So I have this door trim I picked up at, uh, at Home Depot. It is 5 16 inch wide and a quarter inch thick. So they call it D profile. I'll show you why. So we go ahead and peel open this box. It has, see how it kind of looks? Let's see if I can get that to kind of come into focus there. Oh, it kind of looks like a D. So what happens is this has an adhesive tape on the back and you basically just grab it in the middle and you peel it apart. I usually like just go, start at the top, running my whole way down and then uh, trimming it off at the bottom. But I'm just separating this peel and stick back from it and then I'll just go up here towards the top and I will push it up against that door stop peeling down this trim and then just kind of again keeping it trying to keep it you want to keep it on the side of the door stop not on the actual side of the frame because the door is going to you know impact into the door stop itself so 
So we're just going to continue the whole way down. All right, folks, now we're going to come in here and put in our, our ball cash that I was telling you about before. So what it says to do, just reading off the instructions, figure out where you're going to put it, then mark kind of your points. I'm going to tighten this in all the way so that we can get as close as possible. And it's uh, actually, you know what, maybe we'll just take the whole thing out. That's probably better. We'll just unscrew this whole thing. And then it'll give us an idea of where to mark for the plate. So, you know, put wherever you want to put your plate. So, we could put it on the outside edge here. Um, you know, but because this is the center, like the center of 2x4, and this is just a 1x4, I don't really want to be drilling into between these two boards because I feel like I'm going to have a bunch of chip out where these two boards connect. So what I did on the other door, which is what I think I'll do here, is I'll just mount this right smack in the center of the 2x4. So I'm going to put it kind of right in the middle here, I'm just kind of eyeballing it. I'm going to mark the center here for this. I'm going to do a little mark around Oops. the outside here as well, just to get myself a little bit of a concept of where this thing is supposed to go. Now what it says to do on the instructions is drill two 564th of an inch pilot holes for the screws and then a 1316th of an inch pilot hole an inch and 5 inch inches deep for our little central guy. So I do have a 564th inch drill bit so we're just going to kind of line this up right here. There's our pilot hole there. And then right here, there's our pilot hole there. All right, so we're back here. I have a 7 eighths of an inch drill bit. That's pretty damn close. That's, we need 3 quarters of an inch. It's pretty much on uh, one way or the other. I figured a little bit bigger, this thing will fit no problem. And really, the screw holes are going to be what really holds it in place rather than the central piece. So I'm just going to do my best to line this up in the center here. There, and we'll just drill this in. We'll see how we're doing here. Yeah, so we got plenty of room there. Realistically, I mean, if we go all the way to the back, I think that's enough. Yep. All right. So that was enough. So we can go ahead and uh, I'm going to clean up all this sawdust off the floor here. And then we can go ahead and mount our plate. Yeah, because this is sticking out so much right here on the top, this is not going to shut. So fortunately, the threshold on the door is just close enough that even with that plate, with the ball screwed in, screwed in all the way, and with the tabs you know perfectly flush to the wood, it just catches and it would just tear the crap out of the door. So what we're going to do so use a hammer and a chisel, and we're just going to cut out a little bit here to set this thing back in a little bit. anything just just enough just what we need we spent so much time making this nice door we don't want to totally destroy it okay. yeah so we're still pretty much we get to go a little further on this side here we might be able that might do it especially if we do a, give it a couple taps here Flatten it out a little bit in the space. And then, maybe, with our screws, it'll pull us in enough. And then we'll be, we'll be in a good spot here. Let's find out. Well, it's looking pretty good. Moment of truth here. Let's see if it'll shut. Okay, that shuts in there. 
We might be able to even spin this ball out a little bit. But that might be enough. We have a little bit of clearance. So now we just need to figure out exactly where our strike plate's going to go on the door. We're going to want it to marry it up exactly where we want it, kind of on the inside in here. And then we'll move to the inside and do that. So I've marked out where I think the strike plate's supposed to go based on some measurements. So it says the inside needs to be mortised out. And rather than trying to do it with a hammer and chisel, I've got a 5 8 inch Forstner bit. And we're just going to go in real slow and make a little divot with this. We'll put the drill bit right below it and do it again. So now we'll just take this chisel and square up that hole. That sits in there perfectly. So what I'm going to test now is see if we shut the door, does the ball from the door go in there? And if it does, then we can put the plate on. All right. So as you can see, I actually had it to chisel out around the outside of this one as well because um, it wouldn't shut, it kept interrupting, but you can see there's a little bit right there of scraping. Right there, you can see there's a little scrape right here, and obviously the wood started, or the paint started to chip off there. So I may take either a sander, uh, you know, some sandpaper, or just a chisel and slowly shave that down so that we don't have any more interactions because it's just kind of doesn't really look like it's impacting the door itself at all the door seems okay it's just the door it's the, whether it be the ball i think it's actually the ball itself is rubbing as we shut the door so if i back this thing up and zoom ourselves out a little bit so we'll go ahead and shut this door we can see right here the interaction a little bit closer here so you can see it'll push see how it's impacting right there but it's what's impacting it is the ball itself which is fine because that's what we want and when we push see that's what's causing your little indentation right there and then you'll hear it kind of click and now that is in place. So if we back ourselves out a little bit, we can show you the door is done, open, and close. So that's it. That's building a dungeon door the nerd immersion way, or at least, you know, the only way that I know how, because this is the, only the second door I've ever built. I built two doors exactly, and they are both right here on either side of this camera here in this basement. So, um, one, thank you to everybody who had such a positive feedback about the first door that I literally decided to make this second door. I was just planning on having a standard door leading into my shop, but everybody wanted to see how it was made, so I made this secondary door. Um, so, I also wanted to apologize for any of the shots where they were poorly done, or I was kind of blocking with my body when I was making a cut or doing something. Um, again, this isn't my standard style of video. And unfortunately, the nature of woodworking with this is if I cut the board and the, the video take was bad or blurry or something like that, well, the board's already cut. And in some instances, it was only one cut and you didn't need, like, I can't go back and redo it because it's already been done. Also, would I change anything the way I built this? Well, I built the whole series of doors using a 2x4 frame. As you saw me struggling around moving this, it's immensely heavy. Um, it's not, it's, I mean, I can still move it by myself with no issues. Uh, but depending on who's moving this door around, this may be a problem or not at all. So in theory, if you wanted to make the door significantly thinner and significantly lighter, you could build it with a 1x4 as opposed to a 2x4. So my door is 1 by, uh, one and a half inches thick for the 2x4 and then two 3 quarter inch boards with the tongue and groove board, so a total of 3 inches thick. If you were to put a 1x4 uh, board as opposed to a 2x4, you'd be cutting 3 quarters of an inch of that to make it 2 and a quarter inches. Um, that would also, I mean, I'd still do pretty much everything the same way. I would have still used pocket screws and still done all of the supporting boards in the middle. 
Uh, the only difference would be I would be using uh, shorter nails for nailing things together. I would be using shorter pocket screws uh, and obviously any kind of finishing uh, you know, product uh, as far as like screws going into it for the, uh, the strap hinges. They obviously would have had to have been shorter too so you don't bore out the other side. But that would reduce the weight of this by a decent amount because the 2x4 frame just by itself is pretty significantly heavy. Um, the only potential issue you might run into with that is putting your ball latch in. As you remember, I put it in the middle of that one or that two by four because that gave me one clear place to put it to mount it into without having to worry about crossing boards and drilling a hole through two different boards and possibly chip out. Uh, and then as far as like chiseling and things like that and, and kind of mortising out the spot to put the hin or the ball latch in, it was okay because I was doing it all in one single board as opposed to over multiple boards. Uh, every woodworking project is an experience, in, in my opinion, and I, I'll fully admit that I'm not the best woodworker by any means, and I have a lot of trial and error the way I do these things. Uh, and that's just, I don't know, I guess that's just how my brain works when I'm woodworking. I sometimes, like, I don't sit here immensely and do a ton of planning, which maybe I should, right? Measure twice, cut once kind of a thing. Um, but a lot of times, for me, I just like to start getting into it, and maybe that's because I think I just like to see visual progress on things. So like, I wanna see this door being up, so I'm gonna screw the frame together because look, now I have a door frame. Uh, oh, I wanna cut all these boards. Oh, I wanna put these things together because now I can see the progress of what has happened as I've done it. Where in some cases, it might make more sense to do more cuts up front, to do more prep work, to maybe stain or sand boards individually before it's all together. I don't know. Um, but this is just, again, this is just my process. Like I said, I do a lot of trial and error with these things. I put stuff up. Does this look good? Does this look bad? Uh, maybe I'll take it off and cut it. Um, but, you know, this is only, like I said, the second door I've ever built. And honestly, I don't plan on building any more doors. This was just kind of a fun little project. To, I realistically, like I said, it was just to have the entrance into my D&D &D room look like a dungeon and it has a dragon knocker on it because that dungeons and dragons, right? Um, but I kind of like switching over the shop door to this too. It kind of helps pull the whole room together with this kind of rustic-y, dungeon-y aesthetic. Uh, so that was pretty cool. I, I did enjoy that. The only downside too, I could say with this kind of a door, is if you have to move something really big from one room like to the other, sometimes it, it's beneficial for you to just knock the hinges out and take the door off. Well, there's actually no way to do that with this you'd have to actually unscrew the strap hinges from the door and then take the door off and slide it out of the way. And again, because our door is three inches thick, depending on how it swings and what you're trying to bring in there, you may be reducing your door opening by three inches. Um, so realistically, if I had this door swing inwards, it might have been a little bit better because then it could swing all the way out of the way and then I could still have the full access to my 30 inch door space to transfer things in and out, other projects and whatnot. Um, but I didn't think a dungeon door really felt good opening inwards. I thought it felt better to pull the handle and open it outwards to you. So that's why I did it this way. So let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Again, I do woodworking projects all the time, just in my own house for, you know, I, I just really enjoy it. It's a thing I do for me. Um, like this desk that you see here, I built this desk. I have a coffee table over there, the gaming table in the other room, shelving units and whatnot. Um, so I'm just curious, let me know what your thoughts are. Obviously, I'm not a woodworking channel and I won't become one, but if you're more interested in these kind of projects or woodworking style like projects like this, I'm just curious, let me know. Um, maybe I'll look into see what other kind of interesting D&D related projects I can do in the future. Um, so once again, thanks to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me. Thank you again to all of you for encouraging me to make this video. I hope it lives up to your expectations and isn't too long, but I can't promise that because I haven't actually sat down to edit anything as of me recording this. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll see you all next time.